Most people know that the language of the Vikings was Old Norse and that they brought this language with them to England and that this was a language that was already going out of use by the time of 1066 which is usually given as the end date of the Viking Age when King Harald Hardradi of Norway came and was killed at the Battle of Stamford Bridge. However, 1066 wasn't the end for Old Norse in Britain and the surrounding islands, and it was only in 1850 that the last native speaker of an Old Norse descended language died. This is the story of Norn. Norn is the name given to the language that was spoken in the Northern Isles of the United Kingdom that are part of Scotland today, and these consist of Orkney and Shetland to the north. These were referred to in Old Norse as Norfreyr, and these were part of an earldom that belonged to Norway into the later Middle Ages. And on these islands, Old Norse was introduced as early as potentially the 9th century when the Old Pictish language that was spoken there was replaced. Over time, however, this Old Norse developed separately to the other branches and became known as Norn in the region. If you're interested, I've got a dedicated video all about Norn. There'll be a link in the description below as well as in the top right hand side, a card that you can click on. Because today I don't want to focus on the historical language of Norn. This historical language, by the way, the last speaker of which, Walter Sutherland, is recorded as having died around 1850, although many of the words did later on survive into the Scots dialects spoken on the islands. While this last native speaker of Norn died, there is now an effort going ahead that wants to revive the language in what would become known as Ninorn or New Norn. This leads us to the question of can you revive a language? And the answer is yes. Reviving a language is where the last native speaker of a language has died and so there was no one alive that is still speaking the language. This has been done very successfully in a number of cases, though the most successful is with Hebrew. The case with Hebrew is that it was an ancient language that was written down and spoken by the Jewish people and that was then continued on as a kind of language like what Latin is to Christianity, although no one really spoke it, so it often was referred to as a dead language. However, in 1948, with the creation of the State of Israel and many Jews going to the Middle East, they spoke many different languages from across the world. And the creation of a state, it's important to have a language that really everyone can understand within the country. And so they selected the ancient language of Hebrew, and very successfully so, because today there are around 5 million people who can speak Hebrew in Israel and abroad. Perhaps an example a little closer to Norn is that on the Isle of Man with the Manx language, which is a Guadalic Celtic language, whose last native speaker died in 1974. However, in the 1990s, there were efforts to revive the language, and in 2015, there were some 1,800 native fluent speakers of the language, and now there are also people raising their children with this as a first language, so Manx is in that way coming back as a real spoken living language, as well as just being one that is acquired as a second language by enthusiasts. Cornish as well is in a, a similar position, although again somewhat different because with Manx there were recordings of people speaking it which really really helps for a revival project, whereas with Cornish the last first language Cornish speaker died in 1777 so of course there were no audio recordings from there. But now there are around 550 people who can speak it fluently, with several thousand people able to hold a conversation in the Cornish language, and this number is continually growing. So what's going to be happening with Norn, and how are they going to be able to revive a language that hasn't been spoken there for a few hundred years? Well, the first interesting thing to note is that Ni Norn is actually the Norn for New Norn, and actually follows quite closely uh, the form of Ni Norsk, which was a Norwegian initiative to go back to uh, a purer form of the language before there were several other influences there. And Ni Norn is trying to essentially do something similar, although really this is a language revival in the truer sense of revival as it's been done with Manx and with Cornish. And throughout the video, I will be using this flag, which was made by a Reddit user, link and full credit to that person in the description below, as this is a combination of the flags of Orkney and of Shetland, which I'll be using for Norn, as this is where Norn survived the longest, although there was also Norn being spoken in Caithness, the part of the mainland, but I covered that in the other video on Norn. So how will the Norn language, if this indeed goes ahead and is successful, be revived? What is the process involved here? 
Luckily for the revivalists, there are some texts that have survived being written in Norn. Now, originally, actually, the language being used was some kind of old Norwegian, as the islands were for a long time a Norwegian possession, and they also were under the thrall of the Danes for quite a while, so things were also written in Danish, but obviously the written down was different to the vernacular in these islands, although from the 17th century, there are a few texts in Norn. So here, for example, we have the Lord's Prayer, as it was written in the Shetlandic dialect of Norn from the from the Shetland Isles, which you can have a look at, as well as here the same texts, but then in the Orcadian dialect of Norn. And you'll notice if you have a look here that actually there is a lot already of Scots influence, particularly in the Orcadian one, which isn't surprising given that the Orkney is really a lot closer to the Scottish mainland than Shetland is. But from this, we can have a look and we can obviously get a lot of words by comparing it to the other North Germanic languages, and we get a good idea of what Norn looked like at this later stage. As it's the case that increasingly from the 18th century onward, speakers of Norn began to switch their language to Scots and no longer taught their children to speak Norn, it is true actually that because of this language shift, quite a few Norn words and other features such as uh, we will explore like the cadence and the phonology actually went from Norn into the dialects that were spoken of Scots in Shetland and in Orkney. And this is particularly interesting if you look at some words from the Shetland dialect like Gauster and Schalder. It's interesting that there are remnants that are retained from the Old Norse. And actually, if you compare these words to, for example, the Old Norse words of Gusted and Chalder, then you can see here that the final R is the inflectional ending that we see in Old Norse as well and denotes that these aren't words like gust from that you might find in Scots as well, but are the Old Norse remnants. And you can also see this with other words, for example, in the words like hegri, skori, and kavi, you can find out again that they have these endings that are from the Old Norse. And so these bits are preserved in the modern dialect. Indeed, as well, with the Orcadian accent, it has been said that the Orkney cadence is quite different from that of any part of the mainland of Scotland, and there is not the slightest possibility of confusing it with that of our nearest neighbour, Kate Ness. But on the other hand, a Norwegian in Orkney listening to Orcadians talking among themselves at such a distance that only their tones were audible might well imagine he was at home in Norway. It is one of the most remarkable things about speech that people of the same stock, living out of touch with one another, may become mutually unintelligible so far as vocabulary is concerned, and yet retain the tune they speak to, particularly unchanged through centuries. Such has been the case in regard to Orkney and its motherland Norway. And that's from The Viking Legacy by J. Geipel. It's largely thanks to the work of one man that this revival would be possible at all, and otherwise it really would be grasping at straws. And this is the work of a certain Jakob Jakobsen, who was a linguist and a philologist from the Faroe Islands, these islands that are between Norway and Iceland, and actually to the north even of Shetland as well, being one of its closest neighbours. And he went to the islands, he was very interested in this language as it was disappearing in the late 19th century, and particularly studied those dialects on Shetland, so those closest to his Faroese homeland, and recorded in 1894 some 10,000 Norn words that were still remembered by the older generations that were there. Remember, they were no longer speaking Norn as a first language, but it was somewhat retained to some degree there with people remembering words and perhaps remembering songs and little prayers and things like that, as their parents' and grandparents' generation had perhaps grown up with the language still there. And in 1928, he published his findings in Etymologisk Orbuk or den Norden Sprog på Shetland, which was later from the Danish original translated into English. This gave a comprehensive account of the vocabulary of the Shetlandic dialect of Norn, and it was followed in 1929 by the work of a Scotsman, Hugh Marwick, who wrote down around 3,000 words from the Orkney Norn dialect that was found on Orkney, and this then together can be used to work out the kind of ancestral Norn language that was spoken across the two, which is being used for Ninorn. Even with the historical accounts of Norn that have survived by speakers of the language itself and the work by these historical linguistics, there are still gaps in the Norn language that we don't have anywhere attested. 
And we can fill these in by looking at other languages that are descended from Old Norse, just like Norn is. These are called the North Germanic language family today, and they include mainly the Scandinavian languages, as well as the languages that spread across the North Atlantic. This last group are known as Insular North Germanic, and if Nynorn was to rise today as a, a new language, it would surely fall within that and potentially within its own subgrouping, depending on how Orcadian and Shetlandic Nynorn would be seen and whether they'd be dialects of one Norn language or seen as separate languages is a completely other matter and quite frankly irrelevant before such a thing occurs. However, we can fill in the gaps that I mentioned by looking at the other languages, particularly the insular ones, which are Icelandic and Faroese. And as well with the particular example of Icelandic and to a lesser extent in Faroese, when there was a national consciousness among the Icelanders who started to look at their language and started to move towards independence, they coined many new neologisms, which basically means that they... Uh, removed a lot of the Danish words that had come into the language as well as some of the English words and Norwegian ones and instead replaced them by creating new compounds using Icelandic words instead of foreign words. And it may be the case that if Nynorn is going to develop further and fill in these gaps, of course some of these gaps will be modern technology, things like phones, internet, cars, planes, etc. And it may be the case that then they look at making Nynorn neologisms, potentially based on some of the older Icelandic ones, as many Faroese words are now doing, are looking at taking over some of the Icelandic words. And there is a counter movement now that is arguing, actually, we should be making our own Faroese neologisms. So that would be something else interesting in the development of this language. Something else to consider with the reconstruction of Norn is looking at the Scots' influence on the language, as the later variants of Norn were very much influenced by Scots, and you can see Scots' words and sort of the erosion of the case system and inflectional endings towards the later period of written down Norn. And of course, the speakers of Norn switched to speaking Scots, which is why Norn is no longer spoken. So in reconstructing Norn in Nynorn, one would have to look at how much of this Scots' influence they would allow to to retain. There is even question of whether there was actually an in-between phase between the Norn period that when it was spoken and the Scots period and that there might have been some kind of mixed language there, although this has recently been shot down a little bit by some linguists, although it is true that this was seen to a certain extent with Manx, that there was an awful lot of English influence in the later Manx, that then with the revival they've tried to remove that because it's seen as sort of not natural is the wrong word to use here but not part of the original Manx language. So with the Nynorn project that they've established they've mentioned a few things that they'd like to remove in terms of the Scots influence. So these are things like AI being used rather than just I and in some contexts just the E vowel. There's also a removal of the definite article D which is imported from Scots and wasn't native to the older forms of Norn as well as removing the preposition to and changing that to till which is still seen in most of the Scandinavian languages as well as older variants of Old English for example in Northumbrian Old English. The infinitival ending of just having an A is restored as well as having the masculine names ending in in changing instead to ing just as one finds in Old Norse and the present participle in being changed to ande instead and again that in is part of what in English we would say ing as in running in Old Norse that would be renonde so you get the picture. However, at the same time, the developers of Nynorn don't want to bring too much of the Scots out of the Norn language because at the end of the day, that is part of what makes Norn different from the other Norse languages because we don't have early Norn that's recorded. So we don't know at what time exactly Scots started to influence Norn and actually how many of these developments that today we think might have come from Scots actually were independently developed by the Norn language itself because actually some of these developments that were initially put down to being due to Scots, let's say erosion or contact with Scots, have also been found in Danish. So it's not always the case that such influence is necessarily a bad thing for one, or that some changes have actually been caused by influence from Scots. So it's a bit of a balancing act in the, again, on the creator page, which will be linked in the description below, you can see the uh, philosophy behind the, the Ninorn development program and which they've decided to include and which to leave out. 
What's interesting then is to think about what this Ninorn language might actually look like. And we can see this by looking at, exam for example, comparing it to the other insular Scandinavian languages. And the, this is looking at the word for horse in Ninorn as it's set out based on what we have remaining to us. And you can see here the case system with the singular and the plural, the nominative, accusative, dative, and genitive cases there. And then we can compare it to say Old Norse, it doesn't look very different. And then Icelandic is almost identical. And once again, Faroese with very little variation. And comparing them all together, if you're interested, you can pause it here to have a look at how they all compare with one another. For comparison, here are two identical phrases is the one in Ninorn and then again in Faroese and you can see that actually written down they look fairly similar but there are some quite standard differences that you'll see between them which would make having this addition of Ninorn in the insular language is quite different and you could also for example translate this into Icelandic and then see that it looks slightly different once again. However, a little bit deceptive, and I mentioned this in my talk that I gave on the Faroese language, is that its orthography, so the way it's written down and spelled, was based on Icelandic orthography. However, the phonology of the language, so how it actually sounds, is really quite different to Icelandic. And in this way, I think from having looked at the page on Ninorn and how they think that it should be pronounced, as well as some of the orthographic practices there, I think that Ninorn would sound more like Faroese a lot of the time than like Icelandic. Icelandic retaining quite a lot of the more open-mouthed sounds of Old Norse with the dental fricatives and rolled R's and things like this, whereas Faroese is a little bit softer on the ear a lot of the time. As I mentioned, the dental fricatives, and um, this image has to go with any mention of a dental fricative, these are the sounds of thorn and ev as they are shown here, and it's basically your th and the sounds that in English we still have the sounds but not the special characters, whereas the development for norn would retain the ev, although it would actually become a zero, which basically is linguistic talk for you normally miss out that sound, even if it's still written orthographically, apart from in very specific positions. Another interesting sound change for Ninorn would be palatalization, which also occurred. So this is like having the y would be pronounced like a y in English. You'd have a sh, which would be a sh, and a ch, which is a ch. And incidentally, ch is also the exact same way that that sound is written in Frisian. It makes a lot more sense than writing it ch actually, as is done in English. And what's interesting about palatalization is that this is something that's found in the Germanic languages a lot more in the Anglo-Frisian branch. In fact, they're, they're famous for it, and that's where you get things like church, cherike, cheese, cheese, rather than kirk and kas and things like this. So it's an interesting one that a lot of palatalization has happened in Norn, and that's something that's seen back. So that would give a very interesting flavor to the sound of Ninorn as opposed to the other North Germanic languages that don't palatalize so much, and that's why you have fisk, in most of the Scandinavian languages and skip rather than fish and ship. So will the Northern Isles start speaking Norn again? That's a very good question and only time will tell. It's gonna be a very interesting one because of course Cornwall was a very successful example of a language being brought back by language enthusiasts after centuries of the language not being spoken and is now spreading throughout the county. There are more and more people speaking Cornish and there are signs and schools and that kind of thing springing up. So it's not completely impossible, although it remains a very small percentage of Cornwall's actual population and it doesn't look like there the people are going to en masse switch from speaking English to Cornish and so I don't think that's the scenario we should imagine for the Northern Isles either and I think potentially there's a lot less enthusiasm for it in the Northern Isles than there is in Cornwall. One thing however is that Shetland particularly but Orkney as well has a lot of historic and current connections to places like Norway, Iceland and the Faroe Islands and geographically that makes sense. In fact Shetland you'd expect if you saw it on a map would be more linguistically linked to the Faroe Islands and to Norway rather than to the south and actually it sits in between those. So perhaps that would be a reason that people might think to move and, and to, to learn at least a language that would allow them to communicate with definitely the Faroese and potentially to a lesser degree Norwegians as well. Although once again the mutual intelligibility of a Ninorsk uh, or a Ninorn language would be another subject for debate and would be quite interesting to see if someone who picked it up as a second language would then also find it easier to communicate with Icelanders, Norwegians and Faroese people as well. Although perhaps that would be an incentive for some to learn. 
There is clearly a big obsession with the Viking Age and that Norse element of the past in Orkney and Shetland, as you can see at Upheli A, which is this festival, this great big Viking festival, as well as a lot of people being interested in general in Old Norse and learning Old Norse. There's a lot of people studying that at universities now, as well as online, looking at places like Memrise to pick it up as well as here on YouTube with channels looking at old languages like Jackson Crawford, Simon Roper, and of course, Lennon and the Old English as well, looking at different old languages and the interest as well, more mainstream perhaps, in music that's sung in these older languages, looking at bands like Vardruna and Heilung to mention just two of them. So it's not completely unfounded that this might actually gain some traction in the Northern Isles and possibly elsewhere as well, and that people will take the time and they'll learn this as another language and potentially start to see it being spoken around and about, obviously as the second language to begin with and potentially uh, after the next generation, someone might be brave enough to teach their child that is a first language and you might get a situation like on the Isle of Man. I don't think that's likely to happen anytime soon, but I am interested to see where this goes. And actually, just to show how popular this time period is, there was an unexpected shout out for my own department on the news just the other day. Last year, there were more people at Cambridge studying Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic than they were studying Chinese. Anyway, if you'd like to get involved, I will leave the links in the description below to the webpage for Ninorn, which is how I found pretty much all the information for this. And also to highlight that if you want to learn some of Ninorn, you can because there is a Memrise uh, quiz. Is it a quiz? course, memory course, in which you can learn Ninorn and I will also link that in the description below. I had a quick look at that and that looks really cool. And if you are, if you, any of you are from Orkney or Shetland and know anything more about this or want to talk more about it, then please do write in the comments below. That'd be really awesome. And if you're not and want to learn it, let me know as well. And otherwise, let me know what you think about Ninorn. Do you think it has any chance of, you know, rising up and becoming like some of those Celtic languages like Manx and Cornish and that potentially, who knows, in the future, future, we might see some Ninorn on Orkney and Shetland, potentially on some signpostage, who knows? We could be going to have English tourists struggling not just with the, the Gaelic place names that are on many of the road signs in the north of Scotland, but potentially also with some of the Ninorn ones. But that all is very hypothetical, and for now it seems to be, I don't know if it's just one guy working on it, or if it's a little community of, of people who are enthusiastic about it, or whether, you know, it really could spring up and become something who knows, but it's a very interesting topic nonetheless. A very big thank you to NordPass, who is sponsoring this video and has made it possible for me to dive into this topic on Ninorn by sponsoring me here today. Whether your passwords are in English, gibberish, or even in reconstructed Ninorn, it's always a good idea to have them secured. And with NordPass, you can do just that. NordPass helps keep your private information safe online with a variety of different ways. It stores your passwords all in one place. It generates actually secure your passwords, as well as alerting you if a website that you've used a password on has had a data leak, which happened to me recently and means you have to change your password. Instead of having to go around all these sites, it does this automatically for you, as well as flagging up suspicious websites you may be, you may be going on that are leaving you vulnerable to attack. With NordPass as well, if you follow the link in the description, which is nordpass.com stroke history Hilbert, and use the coupon code HISTORYHILBERT, then you can get 50% off a premium plan for an entire year. And the link is in the description below. Coupon code is HISTORYHILBERT, and that is with NordPass. Thanks again for sponsoring this video. So that has been it for today. Let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed this video on the Ninorn reconstruction effort, as well as more generally how one would go about reconstructing a language that is no longer spoken as a first language by people and how that can go in different cases. Do let me know if you found this interesting and if you'd like to see more videos on this. I have no idea if this will go anywhere or if this was just someone's fun project that they decided to make a website about and that I have then found. Check out NordPass as well, that will really help the channel out if you use that coupon code because it really does allow me to you know, take a half an hour out of my day to sit and look at a reconstruction effort for the lost North Germanic language of the British Isles, which is really quite cool. And let me know in the comments below if you will ever try and learn any Ninorn, if you'd heard of it before, um, and especially if you're from Orkney and Shetland, that would be really awesome to hear from you. But anyway, this has been quite a long video, so I'll cut it short now. I have been Hilbert, and this has been The History.